Hello, everybody. This is Mike Young with a plantbaseddiet.org, and I'm here with Thomas Wade Jackson, who is obviously not in the studio. He's actually outdoors, <laughs> which is actually the best place to be in, I believe it's northern Florida where he's located. So welcome, Thomas. Hey, Mike. How's it going? Well, it's going good here. I'm, I mentioned to you before we started, I'm actually on a fast of food. I haven't had anything to eat in 48 hours. been drinking water. But so that's new for me. And, you know, it's just the way the whole feeling of it actually is new. And I know that it kind of ties into what I'd like to talk to you about today. You know, in our little interview here is just kind of the projects that you've been working on and, and what you've got also that you're working on that hasn't been released yet. Because some folks might know you from the Prayer for Compassion movie. We've shown that at an event, a fed, veg fest we did in Florida. I also met you in person for the first time at another veg fest about a, a month and a half ago in Tarpon Springs, Florida. So, you know, your movie, A Prayer for Compassion, and this is going to give my quick summary so you can maybe we can dive into a little deeper. It's really talking about just uh, just religions and I guess religion over time, the history of it and, you know, how that kind of ties into just I think my summary is this a, a not a, a teachings of non-harm and love right and of course how all that ties into veganism and, and being plant-based is is that a good summary that's a good summary you know um we basically interviewed a lot of different religious and spiritual people about the teachings of compassion at the heart of their tradition right that's the summary of what it's uh the theme and what it's about trying to explore how veganism is related to, um, well, you know, it's just natural when you hear these teachings is basically describing a nonviolent vegan lifestyle. Yes. So that's basically what it builds the case. I mean, the story of the movie, it has to do more with me trying to make a better world for my daughter because, yep. you know, I became vegan um, when I lived in New York City and attended a unity church um, in 2005 before YouTube and all of that. I didn't have anybody saying, hey man, have you heard of veganism and vegetarianism? What happened is, is I grew up in South Georgia and I had seen animals killed for food. I saw yeah. my grandma wring the necks of chickens. I saw my dad clean fish alive. And so they were, and you know, and those were traumatic for me as a child in some yeah. way, like they were shocking, but, but I remember thinking, you know, well, one day I'm, I'm looking up at my dad and going one day I'm going to have to be a man and do these things. Like it was just, so a part of me kind of went to sleep. I kind of put a part of me to sleep at that time. And as I started a regular daily meditation practice, when I lived in New York, I was in my mid thirties. What happened is, is I, um, I started realizing when I went to eat, cause I was more present that, Oh, that was an animal. And he died right. because of me. Yeah. Wow, that doesn't feel in alignment with me, with who I want to be. Yes. The nonviolent, uh, peaceful person I want to be. So veganism came to me that way, you know, and that, that was 16 years ago. And uh, at the time I went to the Unity Church and nobody I knew was vegan or vegetarian, you know, like. Um, yeah, actually, that, and that's a big part of, I guess, of your movie and also a big part of questions that I have just personally about traditional religion to why it isn't brought up why why that aspect isn't brought up you know and i know you do touch on on quite a bit of that in the movie and it's it's just something that i i, I have an ongoing con, i guess concern about in a way because I, I feel like it's 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 very important and I, I, let me also say before we move on in this conversation that i echo a lot of what you have said in terms of how you came to veganism for me, it started a lot younger. It was a little bit different, but just that I realized when I was a, a young, a young child, that the food that was being put in front of me, meaning meat, uh, it, it, what when I say meat, I mean it was. I saw blood. I saw veins. You know, it was muscle. I, I couldn't comprehend why I would want to eat something like that when I have a choice of eating something else. You know, and I'm I'm 51, so I grew up in the 70s and 80s when people really weren't talking about veganism, but. In that during that time, I, I, you know, that's that was my thought. It, it, it was my initial thought, and it stayed with me. I was, I was, I fell into into peer pressure during the high school years and in my twenties, 
But after that, I kind of started removing myself from that and thinking independently again. And that's how I arrived kind of at the subject of your movie and what's going on there with, with um, I guess, our traditional religions. And you know, so what can you tell me about just more of that, uh, starting from where you left off and also what the future holds with, with, our, with our spirituality and our beliefs in veganism? Yeah, you know, a couple things is one is I think, you know, I met a lot of people who are like yourself and myself who and one day up to what we were doing, uh, because I think we're all born with this. Oh, I think the signal may have lost the signal a little bit. Wait for him to come back. <laughs> so in the meantime, let me tell you that you can watch uh, Prayer for Compassion. I think it's on uh, Vimeo. I do believe you can you can find it there. And if you haven't seen it, I'm not sure if it's in any other sources. But if you go online and you go ahead and and use your uh, your search engine, you should be able to find it. A Prayer for Compassion, the movie, and it's Thomas Wade Jackson. And I believe it was released something like a year and a half ago. So it would probably be a 2019 release date. And I, you know, I. That, that's actually the best way you're going to find it. And as soon as Thomas comes back up, oh, he'll, he'll be coming back. It's just me right now, but he'll be coming back here. I think he has to reset his, his internet. He's out there in the woods of Northern Florida. That's where he lives, by the way. I want to mention that him with, along with his daughter, they live in a, on a very large piece of property in the, and the, not the, I was going to say Texas in the Florida panhandle. And the Florida panhandle is a lot different than the rest of Florida. It's a, a more natural place a lot less people there. It seems like most people that go into Florida, they want to move further south. They want to be on the coast. This is more inland. They have hills. They have some vast parks and untouched lands. And that's where Thomas lives with his daughter, which is a really, really cool place to grow up. I would love to visit there at some point in the near future. All right, so Thomas is back. And without the sunglasses and with hopefully a little bit better connection, but you are out in the woods, like you were saying. So not, not the, the, the ideal connection, but you still have something. Yeah, you know, it's beautiful to live in the woods and see nature every day. It has so many upsides, but one of the downsides is the internet connections you're able to get here. So, yeah, but and actually, uh, hopefully, hmm? I want to mention one thing I've seen on the internet today, and I've seen it in the past, is that someone has a picture of the woods and it says there's no Wi-Fi signal in the woods, but you will find a better connection. <laughs> true. <laughs> true, true. Uh, we've been blessed for sure. Yeah. So why don't you go ahead and continue with what you were discussing? Okay. You know, um, I think what I was talking about was how we are all born with this true compassionate nature. And then we get indoctrinated into a system of normalized violence. It's all around us, you know, it's, it, having a daughter, she's been vegan since birth, but reading her all the books, the kids books and seeing all the children's programming, it's in there all over the place. Yeah. They normalize it so much, you know, they, yeah. they teach kids to love animals, but then they make a totally disconnecting when it comes to the hamburgers and the pizzas and all that they're showing or in the old, even the old nursery rhymes and stuff. They all have things that kind of indoctrinate us into the system. And, um, you know, one of the things you had asked was about uh, why more religious people aren't naturally vegan. Mm -hmm. um, I think a lot of that has to do with, um, well, when it comes to the ministers, especially like at our Q&A for our premiere, we had Reverend Frank Hoffman on stage and somebody asked this kind of question. Right. And he was talking about how um, churches, he, I hate to disappoint you, he said, but churches are businesses. He says, mm -hmm. and you can take it from a pastor, you know, that they have to make money. And so uh, a minister walks, on, you know, of preaching the truth and keeping people connected to keep the electricity on and to keep it happening every Sunday. You know, so I think right. um, it just it behooves people when you're implicit in something to kind of uh, bury it and have it in your shadow instead of in front of you. Uh, and that's why I think it can be hard for activists to talk to people, because when you start revealing this thing to them, they, their soul knows they're complicit. And there's this sense of shame that can happen naturally. Right. 
And when somebody feels shame, man, it's like you've lost them. Right. Because um, I am for the next film, I interviewed a psychologist, Claire Mann. And she said that what happens is, is that when you feel emotions and feelings like shame or guilt, the blood rushes to the back of your head. And at that point, you hit the fight or flight. It's kind of the reptilian brain. Right. So, uh, so it's, you know, because of this shame is people aren't bringing it up even though like I, at unity you know i said i became vegan at unity and nobody was vegan but right. by the time i made this film one of the last people i interviewed was Un at unity village and i discovered that the founders of unity were strict vegetarians yeah like somehow their teachings were getting through even though like in 19 it used to be part of their actual like uh statement of truth you know of yeah. who they are and then in somewhere in 1953 like after um the wife had died, uh, Miss Fillmore had died, Myrtle, um, how one of the sons or something, they, they decided to take it out. And you know, in, in Unity Village is uh, in Missouri. So it is like, or maybe it's in Kansas right next to Missouri. Right. But it is, um, you know, a lot of battle and stuff around there. So I can't imagine even back then that it was a brave stand for them to do what they did. But it didn't yeah, last. Yeah. And, you know, and I discovered sure. after the film that there are other leaders like uh, for the Mormon, I think, and also for. Uh, uh, I believe I met as I screened the film out, I went to churches and screened it and I would have people come up to me and say, like at a Methodist church and say, well, you know, our founder was vegetarian, like um, right. but somehow it's not wasn't talked about. Yeah, yeah. So so, that's a lot of what happened, why you don't hear it more. Yeah, so here's what I think. Like in my in my mind, when I think about this, I feel like, well, if there is an organized religion, uh, if there's a belief system, and there are people out there that are teaching this to others, I guess my in my mind, my initial reaction is I would hear the absolute top level truth from these people, and we're going to try to strive for it. But I also see the lower end that you're talking about, which is if you if you don't meet people where they are, and people feel like they can never live up to that, then they're never going to come back. And that's, it's disappointing, I guess, to, to, to have that realization, but I'm an optimist and I feel like maybe over time, enough people realize this, maybe things will change. Yeah, well, you know, the other thing, a uh, second point of the ministers is that most of them are meat eaters, so they don't want to look at it. So that's a big part of it too. Right. But uh, what Frank was trying to point out is that the ministers follow, they're more followers than leaders. Ah, so what okay. you do, you work within the church and you get members of the church to go vegan and to start the message. And then the ministers will accommodate in some way and who knows, it may affect them too. So uh, when it comes to our religious organization, one of the biggest takeaways I learned in the last several years of just talking to people is that you really got to go for the people on the fence already and find the passionate people in the church and spend a lot of time with the leaders Mm -hmm. uh, because they're really what we call them leaders. But what Frank was saying is they're followers. Yeah. They follow what, uh, because they have to keep that congregation is the church without the people. There is no church. The church is the people, yeah. no matter how big the building is. So, uh, that's a lot to do with it. And I do have a lot of hope too, because of, uh, the information that's out there now. Like I know you've probably seen sea spirits. Just yes a lot of people's minds, you know, and it's really, and, and it's time to wake up. I mean, we're seeing the effects of uh, uh, climate change all around us. We're seeing, uh, you know, we're seeing the ice caps melting. We're seeing cities starting to go into water. I mean, it's already happening to the point where it's going to be in our face. Yes. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I get you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it makes sense. And I guess I got to put this in perspective too. I'm, I'm thinking about this now. I'm processing that this just as we're talking. And I'm thinking, well, Maybe I shouldn't have the maybe I shouldn't have the expectation that organized religion is going to be teaching all this really super difficult stuff, even though it's so so important. I don't know because if I think about it, is this is an analogy I'm making? If I look at the both schools, they don't teach personal finance, right? That's like a super important <laughs> when you get out of school, but they don't teach it. So I guess it's kind of the same a similar concept. Yeah, and they don't teach emotional literacy. They don't teach um, how to communicate with other people. I mean, they're doing more of that now, I think. I mean, yes. being that we've been virtual with the Melody started virtual classes and 
So I tune in and hear what second grade is like. You have mm -hmm. a great teacher and, you know, and I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm hopeful because she'll have them, they know what meditation is. Like they'll do a little meditation or something like that before a test. Do they always do it? No, but she plays a video of the meditation. So they're planting the seeds yes. at an earlier age, uh, even in public school. Very good. So, and I think that's thing, like, for me, meditation led me to veganism, but it's also led me to everything else I've done, like making the whole film. It came from meditation and it, meditation led me the whole way. And not like I'm this meditator that sits 10 hours a day. It's mm -hmm. just, you know, and not that, because I try to tell people, let's not put rules on meditation, man. It's really just checking in. I do it different at different times. And a lot of times for me, it's just five minutes here and mm -hmm. 10 minutes there, but it's throughout the day to re- focus whatever I'm about to do and editing the film I used to sit down before I would edit and meditate and say a little prayer and just say you know uh, ask this because I'm, I'm dealing with religion and spirituality so I would ask the the founders of those religions or any you know the higher spirits to work through this this is not my movie this is right. really trying to That's start true. a dialogue with uh, spiritual and religious people just because you know the in the film, you'll see like once I was vegan about eight or nine years already, and then I saw Cowspiracy, those two things like just catapulted me into action because, uh, you know, I used to think we all have our own karma, like live and let live, be a good example. I'm not pushing them or anything on anybody. I'm letting them make their own spiritual choices. I'll try to be a good example. Mm -hmm and realized you know I was 45 when I had her so I was like uh or when she was born and I so I was like uh man she's likely to be here a lot longer than me right and things and then seeing cowspiracy and seeing how how damaging a animal agriculture is to the planet somehow I, for a decade as being a vegan I had missed that information but when I got that information it's really scared me and shook me and the prayer for compassion as a result of that, uh, that's that excellent. Awakening. I'm glad you're motivated to do that. And you mentioned meditation. What a good summary. I'm not much in the meditation. I've done, I have done it, but I also feel like the, the way you're describing meditation, it's almost like a way that you can remove yourself at least temporarily from the influences of society, because as you discussed, and as is a challenge in a lot of religions, they can't even get to the super high level of, of thought. And, and a practice, and I guess it's because of what's going on in society, where the members are. So, yeah, I can see, I can totally see that this may, this, all of what you've done may only have been possible through meditation. If, you know, so that's, I'm glad you've been doing that. <laughs> yeah. It's really just opening, being present and opening yourself up to the moment. So you're, I think no matter what you're doing, you do it much better if you're present and you're opening yourself up. Like mm -hmm. I, along the way of going out and speaking because I really am not a public speaker I've always been shy in crowds or talking to people but somehow yeah. when the film I had to do a lot of Q&As and talk to people and do a lot of these kind of podcasts and it's just like I just really kind of meditate before I start uh, become present and then everything flows naturally like um, and so far it's worked pretty well yeah um, so I think it's, it's a great tool. It's a really a great tool of opening yourself up. And the other second part of that is really being open to letting the good come through. Having a yeah. saying, you know, um, in Unity, we used to sing a song at the end of services called Use Me. Use me, oh Lord. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm here for you. And uh, so I think opening yourself up to divine forces to uh, that want us to succeed. I mean, I live in an RV in the middle of the woods, yet I've been around the world twice making a film and sharing the film. I don't know how this happened other than so many connections are made along yes. the way that seem magical, that just open corners by being there. I mean, I have to believe that there's some kind of forces that are out for our good and that when you sign up to do good, they're gonna give you opportunities to do good. <laughs> Yeah, I get it. I, everything you said, I get. It. I mean, I feel like I'm somewhat similar. I'm definitely more of an introvert, and I would never have considered doing all these things that I'm doing, even just talking to you right now as an interview. But I feel like everything is lined up, like you're saying, 
and we're dealing with an important issue that needs to be brought out to the people and that that'll improve everyone's lives. So that is what's my motivating factor. And I don't think about the rest of it. I don't think about that. I don't want to talk to other people or I don't want to have to get up in front of people and, and talk or go out and do this or take chances. I, I just do it because it seems a natural progression of this movement and where it is right now. And that's, I guess that's my part. That's what I have to contribute. And you're doing your part too. And, you know, making, making films and, that's that's a great great way to to get more people involved as you know because it films impacted you in your journey so i'm glad you're doing that yeah you know where i feel we're all being called i feel like uh right now in the situation we're in the universe needs us all to step up and do our part mm -hmm. and we all have a part to play we're not here by accident like these are just things i believe and in, yes. in my my dna i feel like we're all being called another reason to meditate <laughs> it's easier to hear that calling Yes. Uh, you know, I don't want to be preaching meditation, but I do want to preach, you know, um, follow that calling, you know, um, mm -hmm. and even if you don't know how it's going to work, you yeah. know, if I was chance. waiting for everything to line up, I wouldn't have made that film. I just did something every day with what I had and then what I needed came along the way and I never could have imagined how it came. I never could have written that documentary in a million years. It just kind of unfolded because I was showing up. And I think that's our biggest part is we got to be brave enough to show up because right. of the society of shame, because of being afraid of, you know, we're all easily triggered in so many ways. It makes it more comfortable. I should just stay at home and you know, <laughs> yeah. react, connect with people like this. I can always like turn it off, you know, but, yep. but uh, I think whatever the calling is, just trust that you know, and I'll tell you, the doubts have never gone away. No matter how good things go, there's mm. always this thing of like, I don't know if it's, is this going to work out. Like, do it. I'm in the editing of the second film, you know. And so I remember all the same things I had before are still there. It's just a matter of not letting our pre-programmed messages that we get that, you know, we're not enough uh, to keep us from just doing it anyway. Yeah, you know, realizing you know, yeah. what I was going to say. What I was going to say is, I was doing all these talking. One of the I don't really do acronyms, but this acronym popped in my head one day when I was meditating, and it remind and it was really I felt like this is why I'm able to get up and talk to people, and this is why we could probably like we can do this P O V, which is being present, mm -hmm. open, right. present to the moment, and the person open during what they have to say, and you know, and vulnerable. Right. Being vulnerable enough to speak your truth in a way that's respectful to the other person and that, you know, and that's actually, for me, I feel the best activism is for that other person. When you realize that if they're not living a, a, a vegan lifestyle or nonviolent lifestyle, there might be, they're probably suffering in some way. Like I have family members who have been in the hospitals and having surgeries and medicines and you know, people around yeah. my age, yeah. where at the same time, uh, I've interviewed and met so many people and doctors cured themselves of all of these things that right. my family's suffering with. And so it, to me, I, I'm aware that it's needless. They, they are needlessly suffering, right. you know, and there's nothing, it's really hard to watch. I mean, I do try to communicate, but people, it's, it's really hard. It's hard yeah. for people to change. I mean, for some of us, we get a conviction and we just change. Like, that's what happened to me. But you can see I'm not conventional. But people right. who are like, my, my theory is, is that we all used to live in caves in some way. And that when you disagreed or got in an argument with your tribe, you got kicked out. And that right. was going to get oh, you yeah. eaten. Or you were going to starve to death. Yeah. So we have this primal fear. This is why shame kicks us back to that uh, reptilian brain we have a primal fear that of being ostracized mm -hmm. like this is what I've discovered why because I've seen people be affected by the movie and change and I've seen people be affected mm -hmm. by the movie and not change mm -hmm. and uh, the ones that have not changed the more I explore it the more I really believe that they don't want to be different than the people around them. Right. yeah you're right this well, is why it's so let me ask you a question to go for those fence people well, but on that point you just made let me ask a question uh since it's a primal fear that we would be kicked out. And of course there was no way to communicate when you were kicked out, you were gone, right? 
This is way back when. But nowadays, I know that you and I are, are somewhat close in age. And I know that we've grown up with similar things. Like when I grew up, when I was a kid, I couldn't imagine the internet or a phone that was connected to everything. Like that's, that's ingrained in my childhood, right? So, but there are people that are young now that they're growing up like your daughter who her whole life, she's going to recognize or remember that we're all connected. The only way you can not be connected is, is to, to do a lot, a tremendous amount of work to avoid people, which is, is a huge job these days. It's nearly impossible sometimes unless you're meditating, like you were saying. And um, so maybe the next generation or generations will recognize this and maybe that fear will go away, do you think? I think so. I mean, I really think the way information is available um, now uh, and the fact that I mean, in the schools and everywhere, we're much more conscious of the way we speak to people. We're not, we're not purposely shaming, shaming them as bad as we used to. Like, I don't right. know about where you grew up, but you were shamed constantly as a child. Yeah. It's still, you know, it's still happening. People are still doing what they know. You know, I see, I see both sides, you know, so it's, it's probably, it's going to make things faster. But if you look, you know, like, how many years it was that we were in this pattern before we hit the newer age and mm -hmm. but how fast things have moved fast you yeah. know and, and socially and uh, and technology wise like things mm -hmm. have uh, changed a lot just in our lifetime yeah oh yeah i agree i totally agree i mean so i'm looking forward to it i guess i i look at it in a in a positive way and speaking of looking forward to it, so what what can you tell us about the next movie what's going to happen in that movie you know, what are you working on? You've already told us a few things that you've seen because of working on the movie. Like, what can you tell us about it? Um, well, I'll start by saying that after making the other movie and knowing that I really didn't know how it was going to be until it was done. <laughs> like, <laughs> okay. I can only really tell you what I kind of predict and what I've been imagining and what I'm working on. Uh, but it's going to take its own shape. I mean, before, when I saw you a month or so ago, I was in this area, like I'd been through all the footage, I'd watched all the interviews, I had um, logged everything. And mm -hmm. then I, uh, but I was having trouble with that first act. One of the things we talked about down there that made you want to talk to me a little bit was, I was telling you that I hadn't really watched the Prayer for Compassion for two years, all the way through. I'd see the beginning and leave as audience to watch it and come back at the end and see the right. ending. Uh, but when I sat down with all of you at um, Tarpon Springs at Solid yeah. Rock at that vegan, yep. awesome vegan school. Oh yeah. Uh, you know, I knew I was in the middle of editing this or at the beginning of editing this, looking for that first act. And, and I was careful to see the film, to see the journey, to be so detached and see it and see how it worked. And I was like, wow. It was so wonderful on that level. I was enjoying the film, but another part of me was going, oh my God, how am I gonna, that makes it the first act even harder for me. Cause that was the whole mm -hmm. trouble I was having is like, some people won't see a prayer for compassion. They right. They'll see this new one. Yep. And, uh, and a lot of the journey, my story and melody and doing the whole, uh, and doing um, a father trying to save the world for his daughter kind of stuff is set up in that film. So how do I do a first act that honors the people that have not, seen the film and that have seen the film and, and make it, you know, you don't want somebody to say, I'm watching the same film. So, um, <laughs> but after I, you know, so that was like my big delay. How do I do this? How do I follow this up? Like, uh, uh, because this one, I mean, in Prayer for Compassion, there's a little bit of graphic material, but it, I really kept it and watching it again, I realized, oh man, it is such a small amount. It's like less than two mm -hmm. seconds, nothing bloody. I really worked hard to show what people were talking about but there's a certain amount of it in there. This yep. one I'm trying to keep it out of. There's one, I did visit um, Wet Market in uh, India when I was in India this last time. That story will be in there, All right. especially because of a particular thing that happened while we were in the Wet Market. But, um, but when I came back from, um, from the Veg Fest that we saw each other at, mm -hmm. when I got home, I kind of broke uh, through. I started watching footage of Melody and I that we recorded because, uh, you know, if you watch A Prayer for Compassion, you'll see we go, I make all these journeys, but I, and Melody travels sometimes with me, but we're always to the woods and there's always a little cute Beach. interplay or something. Yeah. So I was looking for that kind of material. I saw this thing and it really opened up the first act where I could 
get us through the first act. So I'm through the first act. All right, great. And I'm starting into the journey. And it starts right now at uh, Vegan World 2026, the first one in 2018. We had our first public preview there. Yes. I'm and just this that. weekend, we did the fifth Vegan World 2026 conversion. So, you know, we've been through it uh, many times and we're, we're on the internet right now and we're uh, see how powerful it is connecting us. But I, I'm sure you probably know that Dr. Silas Rao, who's yes. in A Prayer for Compassion and produced it. And he's also in the new one. I, he got, I follow him around India. Right. And, uh, and he's the one that created him and climate healers are the ones that started Vegan World 2026. So, uh, yeah. So he's a big part of uh, being like a guru to me and being in the film. But uh, I'm sure you probably know he was one of the engineers that was helped responsible for the internet that was part of the team. Huh. Did you know? I, no, he, I didn't know this. I mean, I'm glad you're saying all this because even if I know it, others who, who are watching this may not know it, but no, I didn't know that. Yeah, you know, at Vegan 2026, Vegan World 2026 basically started when uh, he when Dr. Rao was uh, tucking his granddaughter in one night, you know, and, and uh, she made the discovery that animals are our family, you know, we're connected. She kind of put that together and asked him about it. And then, uh, and then she realized, once she realized that family, she got kind of upset that all her friends and family are eating her family, you know? And so she got, he's trying to tuck her in and she's getting upset. And, and she says, um, make them stop, make them stop, you know, and he basically said, that's my job, and uh, what comes out that night is that uh, right before that, he didn't say this to her, but right before that, he'd read a uh, report by the World F Wildlife Foundation that showed that between um, two, 1970 and 2010 or something like that, or maybe 14, that we had, our, we had killed uh, 50, 50 or 60 percent of all the wildlife that ever was. Yeah, that's bad. And we wiped them out. And before that, it was another 15 percent. So 85 percent of all wildlife that ever existed on the planet, the biomass of that is gone. Mm -hmm. And he extrapolated out. If we continue to uh, destroy the planet and, and kill wildlife at the rate that we've done it in the last since 1970, that by 2026 there'll be no more natural uh, wildlife in the woods or, you know, be no, no more wildlife. We'll lose, you know, like, these are all be extinct or they'll be down to like nothing. And, uh, and it, you know, the number one corporate culprit is animal agriculture. Yeah. The idea that, you know, we're destroying land that's creating carbon, you know, releasing carbon. We're cutting down all these trees in order to grow food for animals and graze animals. Like just stopping that would save the world. But he, he realized at the time that, um, his granddaughter would be 16 in 2026. And he told right. her, he made her a promise, a pinky promise that he would have more wildlife that we would replenish. Have yeah. More wildlife and like we would work to reverse that. And yeah. so that's how Vegan World 2020 started, 2026 started. And we had the first conference, but he fashioned these conferences after the way they had uh, the original engineers had created the internet. Okay. Um, when they were first, they created conferences where they come together about uh, best practices. You know, uh, different co companies, they, he said they all took off their corporate hats and they all showed up mm -hmm. and everything they did, they gave away. It was all open source. The yes. whole idea was, is how do we make this possible, the internet or this possible where it's all, it'll all work together. Like if, it, if everybody's building it together, you're not going to have compatible parts in some way. Right. So uh, they created uh, task groups. Like, first of all, they agreed on best practices that existed. And then what didn't exist, they created task groups to discover the best practices and Design then it, yeah. practices, whatever. And so that's how it happened. And he did, he said, this is what we're doing with Vegan World 2026. Nice. You know, we, that first meeting, we all got together, we all talked about the issues, we all made lists, big boards of the issues, and we agreed upon what were the most important. We broke them down into categories, and now there are task groups since 2018. That's awesome. They're focused on each of these areas of how do we transition from a, a system of a society of normalized violence to one of normalized peace and compassion and a, a vegan world. Like, how do we do that? Well, I, I think that that analogy and that description about how 
uh, uh, Dr. Rao is is doing all this is is amazing because I think now that I'm thinking about it, that's what this is all about uh, is education. And when he connected the world through the processes he learned in developing the internet, that was just what he needs to know how to connect everyone now through this education to improve society. So I totally get it. It totally makes complete sense to me. Yeah, yeah. he's an amazing person. And uh, I'm just honored to, to be a friend and have him as a mentor. Yes, yeah. He'll be um, in the next film, so he'll be part of that. So in the next film, we kick off at Vegan World 2026. Then it just explores the journey Melody and I made putting out the film, you know, we've gone, we went to marches and to some sanctuaries like in the other one. We did a pig vigil. We went, you know, uh, mm -hmm. we, she went to New York for the premiere. We got to go to London and premiere it and, and different places. And, uh, and along the way, what I was really exploring this time, because the, the title of the film is Compassion in Action, Bringing the Elixir Home. Mm -hmm. Really about trying to take what we learned in the other film and apply it like you know uh to actually put it in in action and to highlight people that are putting their compassion into action perfect um so we're taking the film around trying to bring the elixir to people and um the elixir of veganism and the subtitle if there was one more room for one more title it would be uh how i became a veganangelist probably okay <laughs> uh, you know going from the guy who in the first film there's a scene when I'm talking about right before I cut, become vegan, there's a scene of me trying to enter, I'm in New York and I'm young and I'm trying to introduce, I'm making a video for my family. And I keep starting over and over because I can't even do a video for my family, you know, like I'm too shy to even talk yeah. to the, oh, yeah. the, journey, the journey of the two films is like my character arc as a, one of the characters in the film is going from that to someone who can stand up in front of anybody and mm -hmm. preach the gospel of spiritual alignment. Yes. Because gospel is nothing but good news. Yes. You know, I'm a vegan because I have a gift. I have good news to bring to you mm -hmm. that, you know, the more you align yourself with your true compassionate nature, the better you're going to feel, the more connection you're going to have to all life, you know, the more um, just guidance you're going to receive. And uh, it's all just you know, the connection you're going to feel to everything. It's just amazing. And your spiritual path. But um, the other thing I like to say is, and vegans can align themselves more too. Yes. Oh, yes. It has to do with self-compassion and self-care. We didn't get into self-compassion in the other film. This okay. one, I, you know, I want to talk about taking care of yourself. Okay, good. You know, I, want, I encourage everybody to really love yourself and to give yourself good vegan, healthy food, exercise, meditate, and get good sleep. Those are my four pillars of well-being. If I can yeah. include those in my life, I usually feel pretty good and I feel more productive and able to do more and uh, take on more. So um, the film is about all of these things in some way, <laughs> but that's really um, self-compassion and self-care is so important to me. And that third, and the other theme within that is communication. Okay. Effective communication. Um, how do we, we have a, an important message to give to people. Sorry about that. It's okay. We have an okay. important message to uh, share and, um, I know so many activists that they work so hard, they burn themselves out, you sure. know? And a lot of times, could are people hearing what they're saying? Like, how could we be the most effective activists we can? I, we don't break it down like that, but effective communication is such a part of it. Taking care of yourself, effective communication. Uh, so I interviewed Dr. Claire Mann, who I mentioned earlier, or uh, vegan psychologist Claire Mann, who I mentioned earlier, and Dr. Melanie Joy at the Animal Rights Conference in 2019. And, both, and I interviewed them about, you know, how to communicate to people. And one of the big issues uh, people, vegans, a lot of times will ask me about and is an issue for me, too, is family. How do you get through? Oh, yeah. Family? I mean, you're yeah. sitting here watching them suffer and you love them so much and you know the kind, compassionate person they are. And you but how do you get that message to them when they are the walls are down and turns out family's the hardest like psychologically mm -hmm. family's the hardest it's not oh, yeah. uh, Claire's suggestion was to go out in the community their community and find the people on the fence find the influencers and people in their community that they look up to and care for and, and the ones that have a, you have a talking to and convert convert them because my, the theory of us um, of the caves and all of us not wanting to be different and everything 
in the end, uh, the message I think, or the, the solution to that is to look for those people on the fence, right. go around people that you want to bring vegan, help normalize it. Because by normalizing nonviolent lifestyle, we are allowing the people we love to, to embrace the lifestyle without uh, feeling that fear of being different than the people around them. If they know a few people, they won't have that same yes. fear. Yes. You know? So this is important that we have compassion to bring how we bring them in. If they're closed, it doesn't mean that it's impossible. It just means you have to open up their world around them and, and, um, and find ways to, to bring that. But because honestly, think yep. about it. Like one of the things I asked a couple of people in the film was, um, did they know that when a cow went to get milk, the cow had to be impregnated. A baby was taken usually the first day. It's a boy, it goes to veal, goes to slaughter. If it's, you know, if it's a girl, she gets locked into the system for, you know, five or six years of having babies, giving milk, having babies, you know, and then being yeah. sent to slaughter. Like, I, I mean, I can't even get through the first two questions and nobody, they don't know. People yeah, they, don't right. know. It's new information, yeah, because people don't, they don't, they don't want to talk about those, those bad parts that you don't see. And if you don't see it, they just pretend it doesn't exist, but it does. Yeah, and so and when you do tell people, my experience has been they say I need to look into that. I need to ask the farmer. Like they don't want to accept it. Yeah. So I think and, and you know I'm sure after the conversations and the pressure is gone, they just throw it away. A lot of people, the people that are we're having trouble reaching, but uh, even those people, like I think 99.8 or 9 percent of the population would be totally out of alignment with taking impregnating forcefully impregnating being and taking their child away from them uh, I yeah, really agreed. Believe that's not in alignment with anybody's true compassionate nature i do not believe that's in alignment with yeah, yeah. anybody's true compassionate nature so for them to do things that are against their true compassionate nature creates suffering in them and you know because i believe our soul knows when it eats that animal i believe our soul sure. because i know that's what I, that's what happened to me when i got sensitive enough yeah. I, I just oh, yeah. my mind but I believe my soul always knew it. It always knew there was this thing going on. It wasn't right. And it always kept me from being mm -hmm. as open and fulfilled and as uh, connected to life as I could be, because you have to shut down to a part of yourself. Yeah, I agree. Because yeah. if, if you're consuming that, uh, I think as we both know, that becomes part of you. So in order, f it's, you kind of have to get, get off of that to start thinking more clearly. And you really probably you're probably thinking more clearly now than you ever have because you've been off of it for so long. I think it's, that's important for people to know. I think a lot of people don't understand that. And like you were saying earlier, some folks are very hard to reach. And that got me thinking when you said that about, especially the family or whoever it might be, but especially family, that the 80, 20 rule you hear how like sometimes in business, you'll spend 80% of your time on 20% of your clients, you know, which is a bad thing because that's not a good use of your resources. You want to spend, uh, you know, you, you want to get a good return. And that's true with any of your activism, too, because you'll burn out like you, you had pointed out. So it's important to be selective like that, I think. Yeah. Yeah, you know, uh, when you realize you're not getting through to the person, just leave them in love. You know, realize yeah. that you just, all you need to do is plant a seed or water a seed or fertilize a seed and that other people will take care of the rest. Like, once you have an awareness of something, it's like when you learn a new word you never heard, suddenly you hear it around. You're like, hey, I just turned out the radio thing. <laughs> like, yeah. it seems like magic. But that's what happens when you plant these seeds. You may not see the result of what you planted, but 90 something percent of the time is probably not in vain. It probably created some kind of change, especially if you left them feeling loved and respected. True, if you right. left them with a bad taste in their mouth, it could have the opposite effect. Yeah, that's you know, the hard so part. Important. Yeah, you mentioned that earlier in the discussion here about shame, right, and guilt. How, how what, do you have any techniques? How do you avoid, I mean, I guess you can tell, man, I feel like I can tell when I say a certain few things to a certain type of people, the ones who are the most resistant to change, they, they react in a certain way. It's kind of feel that. Yeah. But, um, and that, I guess that's, that's your, the sign that, we need to be aware of and not not push anymore uh, when when we see a reaction bring them back. this is when we bring them back once once we see the blood because here's the second part of the blood going to the back of the head 
mm. is that because we're also connected, there's a contagion effect. When somebody in a conversation, the blood goes to the back of their head, it makes the blood of the other person want to go to the back of their head. This is why sometimes you might be talking to somebody and mm. suddenly feel angry or want to leave. You want to punch them or you want to run away. Like, right. where did that come from? It's right. because they have this feeling and it created that in you. I so see. this is where the meditation yeah. and especially being present with people allow you to at least a lot of times catch it. Even if it happens, you go, oh, wait a second, that's happening. Now that you're aware that that happens. And then you want to put the blood back in the front of your head and pull them back too. Mm. you know, um, having a laughter does that or just yeah. showing compassion to them does that, you know, showing the whole POV. If you can be present with that person, open with that person and vulnerable with that person, you can get through any conversation. The vulnerability may say, you know, being vulnerable, but vulnerable may be going, Hey, you know what? I think we just lost it for a minute. I definitely felt I was getting too aggressive. You know, I'm sorry for that. You know, like that right there brings them back to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Or even how about if you talk about, if you reach that point, as you had discussed here earlier that, you know, we all had a journey. I wasn't vegan at, at, for many years of my life. If we can relate to them say like, uh, well, not in a way that provides guilt and shame though, <laughs> in, in a way that is compassionate. Are you there? Actually, I think it may, the signal may have uh, dropped off again for Thomas, but if it has, we'll, we'll, we'll bring him back too. But anyway, I just want to also mention, you know, that, that the, the follow-up movie to prayer for compassion is not out yet, but depending upon when you're viewing this, it may already be out, but we're going to get Thomas back here in a second to kind of close this out. I'm going to pause the recording when we bring him back. Okay. We are back with Thomas and he's out in the woods as we talked about earlier. So these things tend to happen. We, we don't have full coverage yet, but we don't have a vegan world yet. So we're working on it. <laughs> well, you, you know, my experience is, is that when these happen, they're, they're usually for a reason. Maybe it was time to switch gears or it gives you a chance to remember something that I wouldn't have thought of. Like I thought of and I, something that happened to me that was relatable to yeah. what we were talking about because we had a moment. And when it went down, I, I, it was my internet. I put it back on and while it was booting up, I meditated for just a moment. And that's why I was able to come up with this uh, example that happened to me. All right. Um, so if you'd like, I share that example. Yes, please. Okay. Uh, I was at a Q and A in um, in near San Francisco. It was for a, a film festival that we were in called the Brave Makers, which is a film festival for um, unheard voices. Vo uh, you know, man 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 what am I saying? Uh, marginalized people, all right, uh, and uh, of any sort. Uh, so there was a lot of films about different topics, uh, and two of the people that were part of the planning committee were vegan and they were like what about the animals i mean they don't have a voice we should include one of their films so i think that's how prayer for yeah. compassion came to be screened at that festival uh but while we were having our q a i had dr will tuttle with me and yeah. uh, and uh linda fisher who was in no it wasn't did she come somebody else came uh sorry i'm blanking on that but the main sorry. stories around dr tuttle because uh, there was this lady in the audience who raised her hand and asked some question. I wish I could remember what it was, but it had to do, it's one of those questions about what about plants feeling, having feelings or something. Right. I don't know if it was that, but he answered in this very eloquently direct way uh, that was beautiful. And um, I, I've been waiting for them to send me the footage of this because somebody videoed it. Then I'll know what I'm talking about. But I just remember him answering her so beautifully. And when it was over, uh, she wasn't the only one asking us challenging questions. So when it was over, the people who had brought us there uh, were apologizing to us like, oh my goodness, you know, like, I'm sorry the people were, and I'm like, hmm. what? I mean, that's great. Like, usually I'm in a mostly vegan area, so I don't get these challenging questions. And right, I was right. Like, this is great. It, you know, it, it's good to have a dialogue. Of course. Uh, but they were like, well, imagine if somebody had done one of, you know, about, um, child exploitation somebody got him said a little of that's okay you know whatever he's you know they were like comparing it to all the other marginalized uh, groups that right. the films were about like you wouldn't stand up and say it's okay to do that but somehow with the animals they were doing that right and i was like that's cool but at that same moment i happened to look up and i saw the lady i guess she was waiting for the next film that had asked that question 
and she was with a friend. And I said, give me a minute. I walked up to her and I said, I just want to thank you for that question. You know, um, it's great to, to hear different point of views and to be challenged. And I said, can I just give you a hug? And I gave her a hug and she was totally disarmed. And she asked me um, a question a very similar. I don't even know if she knew it was a similar question, but the answer I gave her was basically my version of what Dr. Tuttle had just said. And when I finished saying it, she said, wow, I've never heard that before. And I thought she had just, he had just told her that. Now, cut to six months later when I'm interviewing Dr. Mann and she, or Claire Mann, and she says, hey, um, the blood rushes to the back of your head and you're no longer able to think for it clearly. It got and you. it hit me that yeah. that lady had felt a little shame by his directness. Right. But she was already probably timid in asking the question. And then once he, yeah. he gave her such a great answer, like she couldn't comprehend it because she was too, the blood was in the back of her head and so Yeah, way. Yeah, I, mean, it, hug, it kind of, yeah I get it. It rocks your whole, everything you had thought up to that point in your life, right? So there's going to be a reaction, like uh, as you described. And you can't hear. And it happened to me one time where we were out of town and some was happening to our, our um, on our property and they needed me to call the sheriff um, to let them know um, to that it was okay to come onto the property because the people that were staying here didn't have the authorization. So I called uh, 911 and then I told them what was going on and they said, where do you live? And uh, I told them the town, they said, well, you know, what's your zip code? They needed my zip code. And, you know, I put my zip code in all the time for my credit card, all these things. Like, it's no big deal. But I was so worried about, Yeah. I was afraid I, the film wasn't quite edited and everything uh, I, in the film was in that trailer. Yeah. If somebody had taken that computer, the film was gone. So I had yeah. all these fearful things going on and I couldn't even remember my zip code. And, that, and this was after I interviewed Claire. So I was like, oh, I know what happened. I just got to breathe for a minute. And I breathed and it took a minute and then it came back to me. But, yeah, that's uh, a, that's it, all part real. of the process. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> that, that's all. It's part of the process with everyone. I guess we don't think about it that often, right? I mean, I'm I'm glad that you're bringing it up. I'm glad that you are addressing it in the the films that you're putting out because it, it's it's probably one of the keys. If, if you wonder why everyone hasn't been converted, and hopefully there will be a vegan world, like you said, in 2026. Well, we have to learn this, right? Yeah, and we can, you know, and there's been so much vision in our world right now that learning to communicate and hear each other I think is important whether it's about veganism or anything like I'm hoping that even people who are not yet who are pregans not yet ready to make the shift that they will see things that will appeal to them and that they can adopt in their life because I think the more you do those things the more you are going to naturally move toward veganism which is our true yes. compassionate nature you make you know you may not see the related how it's related when they shift from this it has nothing to do with food but every they they start taking care of themselves or they start meditating or they start doing this one thing and it just ripples out because we're you know those unseen forces are all around us and they're really helpful here to to lead us forward i think yeah well i'm very i'm even more hopeful now after hearing this from you and discussing this with you and i've learned a few things just in this conversation so i thank you for for these contributions because I, I won't keep them with me. I'll also, like you said, just kind of try to get the word out as best as we can. And I also want to ask you, because I mentioned this before uh, when you dropped off for a second or two, where's the best place to see prayer for compassion if folks haven't seen it already? Well, if, you have, or if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can go to Amazon Prime video and just put prayer for compassion and we'll show up. Um, Excellent. Or you can go to our website, which is aprayerforcompassion.com. And there's a link on the first page to our Vimeo and our Amazon. So okay, yeah, it is on Vimeo too. Along, on Vimeo, you can stream it or download it. Okay. So. Very good. And then the next movie, the sequel, when do you anticipate that being released? Well, I'll tell you, I'll answer it this way. Um, when I started Prayer for Compassion, I really hoped it would be done in six months and it took three and a half years <laughs> like I had no idea um however however I do in a prayer for compassion the last interviews we do is at unity village and I'm basically challenging them I'm asking them hey how come I never heard oh we have Thomas he's freezing up again a little bit well we're going to hear that story in a second as soon as he comes back let me give a quick pause so you all don't have to wait 
All right, we're back. Thomas, you going to finish up? What, you're so saying? what I was saying is that last year, the Interfaith Vegan Coalition and uh, some other organizations had organized a vegan spiritual retreat weekend at Unity Village for last September. And at the time, my thought was, man, that'll be, if I can have the film ready, uh, that would be the la a good last place for the story of the film to end back at Unity Village, back to you know, seeing what we had done differently. So yeah. that had been in my mind. Um, but then COVID happened and yeah. they, they canceled it. But it looks like this year in October, they are planning on having it live at Unity Village again. And uh, the last time I, A Prayer for Compassion, I had the whole film, even the ending edited, at least the first cut of it edited. And I just needed to insert that last interview. You know, I was waiting to get that interview. Right. Uh, I, I can't promise that I'll be that far ahead, but a part of me like wants to be in October, be at a place where I can insert whatever we do in October into an already at least pretty much finished film, first draft. And then sometime next year is when I'm planning on having it polished and everything ready to go out. Uh, if that's what divine timing brings, like okay. I just have to be... Um, surrender myself to that like it, it was really hard in the first film at the beginning of making it being a single dad and living in the woods going I really need to be doing these freelance gigs you know uh, right, right. I need to get this done this little vegan spiritual documentary I need to just knock it out and get it done this little project uh, yeah <laughs> yeah but then you know there are moments I remember where it was just like relax you've got lessons to learn along the way true and that's how it works sometimes we have this we really want things to be uh, done now, but we're not quite ready. Yes. So I think that spirit's way of letting us get ready as uh, those moments come. So just always be loving and working on yourself. And I think uh, that'll catapult you right into whatever it is your purpose is. Yeah, I agree. That That's it. I mean, that's a great attitude. Thanks for reminding us of that because I mean, it is a certain level of maturity, not only as individuals, but as society, right? Uh, we were talking like on an individual level, what you're saying is totally key. I, I get it. But also on a societal level, like, again, going back to why we're not vegan yet. Well, maybe we're just not, we're not quite ready, but we're building that. You're building that too, with what you're doing with the movie. And there will be a time in the very near future where everyone's going to be ready for this. And, you know, hopefully we can have another conversation like this. Well, before that time, uh, if it takes a couple of years into 2026, like you're saying, but even so, I'd love to have a great conversation with you after everyone has accepted this <laughs> and remember these times that, that were of, of struggle uh, and uncertainty that we're going through right now. But like you said, with meditation and I guess understanding more where uh, about compassion in general, and where these where our, our traditional religions have have, a, have come from and approach this. I think all of those are necessary to to get to that vegan world. So I'm looking forward to it. Thank you. Yeah, and, and so thanks for the work that you've done and, and are doing. And again, yeah, Amazon Prime sounds like it or Vimeo to watch Prayer for Compassion and then anticipate the next movie. That's what I'm going to be doing. And you can find uh, you can find this on Facebook at Compassion Movie. A prayer, it's a Prayer for Compassion, the movie um, Facebook, Facebook page. page. Okay. If follow, yeah, if you follow that. And now we have a new... Um, the Compassion Project Facebook page too, but either one of those pages will get you updates and possibly every time I make send out a little preview of things. Sometime I like to, we just put a new trailer out. I don't know if you've uh, seen it. No, um, I'm gonna go look at it after we're done. Our trailer for the new movie. So uh, yeah. All right, thank you. Now. As soon as this interview is over, which is just about, I'm gonna go look at that on Facebook. So thank you again, Thomas. and. Enjoy the woods out there. You know, I would love to be out where you are right now. And it's okay that the signal isn't perfect because you got what people really need is, is nature out there. So thanks for conveying all that to us as well. All righty, man. Beautiful to see you. Yeah, same here.